Hello, welcome to The Revealing. I am your host, Pavarotti, here to bring you information on the Idaho 4 case. As always, as a disclaimer, this channel is for entertainment purposes only. I'm not here to slander anyone. These are my opinions, and with that being said, let's get started today. Today, I'm going to do a little bit more of a deep dive into Mr. Koberger. And I'm doing this for a reason. It's my contention, and I know I've mentioned this in previous videos, and I've had a lot of backlash on this one, that Koberger is a methamphetamine user. And I say that not to try to slander Mr. Koberger, but that is a key point in why he is even a focal point of this investigation. And I need you to, to kind of clear your mind and hear me out on this one, because this one's important, especially if you feel that Koberger could be innocent, okay? Because, of course, everybody's innocent until proven guilty in a court of law. However, where I see this case going, whether you're innocent or not in this court of law may not determine the outcome. And I do believe in our justice system, but I'm starting to see things in this one that's, that's making me question whether things are on the up and up up there in Idaho, Judge John Judge. So the main thing that's kind of set me off is watching Nancy Grace and Mark Furman now, Mark Furman, whenever I watch a show with Mark Furman giving his professional opinion on the matter, I always take a step back and remember Mark Furman was the lead investigator on the O.J. Simpson case. Folks, did, did O.J. Simpson get convicted of that murder or was he found innocent? Oh, yeah, he was found innocent, wasn't he? Now, everybody believes he did it, but due to Mark Furman's terrible investigating, the, the, the jury found him not guilty. So to have that guy up there talking about a case and giving his opinion about Koberger's guilt, that irks me. Now, the other thing that irks me is the recent video that Nancy Grace just put out. And I'm, I'm going to be doing two videos for you tomorrow. One of them is going to be a reaction to that video because that video has, has really got me, and it's got my blood boiling, to say the least. And it's actually inspired me to do something I didn't plan on doing. And as much time and effort as I put into looking at the facts of this case, I'm starting to see two possible scenarios. One scenario I've laid out for you over many videos, okay? And I've taken that one about as far as I can possibly take it. Well, I mean, without me actually going up and, and living in Moscow for about three months and getting out there and talking to the people, I can't take that one any further, okay? I mean, I need somebody up there to tell me the connection between Ton, Ty, and Miss Hatrock and Miss Grenoble. I can't do it myself, and and they're they've hidden they've hidden stuff very well. So so I can't. I mean, I'm not just going to find it myself where I'm at, and I'm not going to be able to do that. So if somebody out there has the ability to do that, do it, because I'm telling you, there's connections there. And once those two connections are made, case closed, as far as that aspect of it. Not necessarily case closed though, as far as Mr. Koberger goes because I've got another theory on this one now that I've seen all the evidence. And I truly believe as a person is innocent until proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. There's some things out there that make me now think there that he's probably what I've suggested he is. I mean, there's, there's, he's probably what I've suggested he is, but I'm gonna say there's a reasonable doubt that there's something else going on. And I can use the exact same 
evidence that I've used up to this point to prove that, and I'm going to do that for you. I'm going to start a series tomorrow in my second video. I'm reacting to Nancy Grace. I'm going to start a series called The Koberger is Innocent Theory. And I know for those of you out there that have been with me for a long time, it may upset you, but we've got to look at everything with the proper outlook because there is two sides to this story and I want to make sure that I tell them both and then you decide for yourself which one that you believe because what the mainstream media is describing, it didn't happen. And we know this. But today, this video is, is on Mr. Koberger. And... What I want to do is bring up his past, bring up his habits right before these atrocities happened, and show you why I truly believe that Mr. Koberger had to use methamphetamines to be able to do the things that he was able to do. Now, with that being said, let's look at this first video. This is um, people that knew him growing up and they're going to discuss when he first began using. He lost a lot of weight, like, really fast. But I feel like he was more confident in himself. I think he had to vocalize his confidence, like, you know, now I'm, you know, I lost his weight, I'm probably more attractive. Koberger loses 130 pounds by his senior year of high school. He did it by running and boxing every single day. Koberger also writes about his transformation in the same online posts revealed by True Crime podcasters, and the New York Times. I used to be this healthy blonde haired boy with blue eyes. And in a few years, I have darker hair and darker eyes, half the body weight. The bullying, the body image issues, those become the seeds from which a need to create a false self that is superior to others emerges. Friends claim Koberger develops anger issues even putting one friend in a headlock, leading that friend to cut ties. Bella says he only sees that side when Koberger's drinking. When he get drunk, he get kind of aggressive, kind of rowdy. There's one instance where he was trying to drive somewhere, and we were, we had to take his keys and hide them. So when I say aggressive, I mean we had to like physically like move him from the keys and prevent him from getting his keys. Friends allege alcohol use turns to drug abuse, and Koberger gets hooked on heroin. He and Bayless lose touch. He started kind of um, branching out from the original group to hang out with a different group. That group, they did some sketchy drugs. Rich Pasca is a former acquaintance of Koberger. He tells Fox the two were deep into an addiction. I met him through some friends and they told me that he was a little weird and I mean, he was a little socially awkward, I guess you could say. Um, but he wasn't a bad guy. I got six years clean now. I work in treatment and everything, but back then I was using. And so that's how I know for a fact he was using. I've got high with him a couple times. Teachers say heroin use is a major problem in that area. At the same time, Koberger's alleged heroin addiction is at its height. His troubles at the tech school continue. He was in HVAC for the rest of, of his time at the Career and Technical Institute and other issues arose that he decided to leave the school altogether um, and not complete his 12th grade year there. After leaving the program, Koberger finishes his senior year of Pleasant Valley High online. Okay, so I look at the key words whenever I'm looking at something. I'm, you know, I really focus in on the words that are used and the meanings behind those words. And there's been a lot of speculation out there that Mr. Koberger, when he got involved in substances when he was younger, that heroin was the substance that he got involved with. And you heard Nancy Grace there talk about while she felt like it was heroin, it was a very prevalent substance up there in, in that area. That was the only reason she gave for that specific substance. Another young lady is the other, only other one I can ever think of that has mentioned the term heroin. And she used it because Mr. Koberger had asked her to give her a ride somewhere to get some substances. 
And I don't think this young lady knows the difference between meth, heroin, and, you know, Tylenol 3, okay? So she probably assumed it was that. But let me explain something to you, all right? Let me go through the typical progression of somebody who uses heroin. Most people don't just go out, hang out with their friends, and shoot up heroin, okay? There's a steady progression before you get to that point, okay? They, they start out with some type of pain, typically, some type of procedure, and they're prescribed pain medication, like hydrocodone. They used to prescribe Oxycontin. And they would take that pain medication until they couldn't find any more, and they became addicted to it. And once they could not get any more prescribed or they couldn't buy any more on the street, then they would go and purchase something like heroin to fill the gap. They wouldn't purchase it and start jamming it in their veins, though. There's different ways that people use that substance, okay? When you see people that are injecting hard drugs into their veins, they have typically been through a long progression that got them to that point. And once they get to that point, it's all over, okay? Unless they have some amazing willpower to come back. But nothing, nothing that I've heard suggests any of this on Mr. Koberger. And as I listened to his friends describe his drug use, one said he got with some people and started using some sketchy drugs. All right, sketchy drugs in no way implies heroin. And then the other gentleman that said that he had used with Mr. Koberger a few times in the past, well, folks, heroin is not a social drug. You don't hang out with your friends and use heroin, okay, because of the effects of the drugs. Once you use heroin, you're in a a state of you're not wanting to talk to people and hang out and socialize, okay? It puts you in a numbing state. Now, what does prompt you to hang out and socialize are drugs like methamphetamines, sketchy drugs like methamphetamines, drugs that you would do in a social setting like methamphetamines. Now, it's very possible that he went overboard using the methamphetamines because as you heard the gentleman state, he had been in rehab a couple of times. Methamphetamines is something that would eliminate weight loss, okay? Typically heroin doesn't unless you're to the stage where you're injecting it, okay? Also mentioned that if she's right and he boxed every day, let me tell you, Mr. Koberger will whoop somebody, he'll whoop their butt. Because if you train boxing every day for a year, you're a bad boy, let me, let me tell you. It's called pugilism, okay? You're a pugilist. And you're a bad boy if you're a pugilist. But let's listen to this next video. And I'm going to explain how his actions in Idaho suggest the same methamphetamine use. Check out, right? If the alibi checks out, they move on to the next suspect. So, time for me to reveal what this alibi is. Again, you're not going to believe it. Take a look. Mr. Accused Murderer has long had a habit of going for drives alone. Often, he would go for drives at night. He did so late on November 12th and into November 13th, 2022. The accused mass murderer is not claiming to be at a specific location at a specific time. At this time, there's not a specific witness to say precisely where the accused mass murderer was at each moment of the hours between late night November 12th, 2022 and early morning November 13th, 2022. He was out driving during the late night and early morning hours of November 12th to 13th. Okay, they used his original generalized alibi. As we all know, that's not his alibi statement. But they used his generalized alibi that he was driving around by himself the night of the atrocity. 
And you also notice that in there it states, he often drove around by himself all night and early morning hours because that's just something he often did. Okay? Now, there's proof, if you would say, that Mr. Koberger isn't sleeping at night. He's driving around all hours of the night. He's doing something. Now, let's listen to one of his neighbors describe his nightly anything habits. anything up there or anything like that? Yeah, we, we heard, you know, we heard loud sounds during the night. Yeah. A lot of, many times. No. Yeah. Not just one sentence. So it seemed like he's a, a night person, not do a lot of things during the day, but during the night he's yeah. active. Right. To like, like clean the floor sometimes, it's vacuum, it's very loud sound. Yeah. So, yeah, it's, it's that, that's the thing, you know, I, I keep telling the journalists and reporters that that is what we heard from the up store, upstairs. Yeah. But it was just, he was a, a night person vacuuming or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, even sometimes, like, in the bathroom, wash, and very late. It's a, not that, not like what it was regular time. Yeah. It's very late night, he would do this kind of stuff. Yeah. So we got stuff, yeah, and many times. Did you ever ask him to quiet down or anything? Or? I actually wanted, but I didn't try. Yeah. Once when I met him, we just see hello. I, I just want to see, could you please keep it quiet because we wake up during the night and have kids on it. But I didn't do that. I think maybe because he just moved in, moved in like August, maybe he need time to get And I've mentioned this in previous videos. That was his neighbor describing Mr. Koberger. And the main thing she remembered about him is how he stayed up and made noises all night long, vacuuming, washing clothes all night long, all hours of the night, kept the kids up. Well, let's think about this for a second. Mr. Koberger, who is a PhD student, and I've had a lot of my commenters go through and say, explain how this PhD student would have enough time to go out and meet people in a criminal organization in a matter of months and go and do uh, all these crimes when he's doing all the work of a PhD student and he's having to you know, do his, his turn papers and, and he's working as a teacher's assistant. He's working all day long. It's just too much. I agree with you. It's too much. By the time he got home after he got out of school and work, he should have been going home and maybe working on his turn paper for an hour or so and then collapsing, but that's not what he did. He went home, maybe worked on his turn paper for an hour or so, then began vacuuming, cleaning, staying up all night. And then some nights he was just out driving around all night after he had worked all day and done all that. And then early morning hours come around and he's back into school going through the motions again. Insomnia does not explain that, folks. Okay, you can, insomnia, insomnia, if you were to stay up all night long and then work all day as a student and then you can't sleep again all night long, guess what's going to happen to you after a very short period of time? You're going to be a walking zombie. You're not going to be able to do anything. Your body will shut down. You're certainly not going to have the energy to be up all night vacuuming and washing clothes and going driving around. No, you're going to be sitting there in a zombie-like state because you have insomnia. There's nothing giving your body the energy it needs after it didn't get the rest it needs. The only thing that does that, and it's not Adderall, it's not you know, dietary drugs. The only thing that will do that is methamphetamines, and I assure you. So how could he get involved with an organization that fast, going through all of that, very simple. He had an in. He had an in before he ever got there. He didn't know anybody there, but his friend did. His friend who he was doing the same things with in Pennsylvania before they moved back out to Idaho. His friend knew everybody, had family members there. He had plenty of contacts. So, Yes, when he got there, let me tell you about a drug organization, okay? They're not going to do interviews. They're not going to do background checks. You show up and you've got somebody that they know and they say, hey, this guy can handle himself and, and we're here to do this. 
That's all they need. That's how that, that's how that world operates, okay? But I digress because there could be a completely other explanation, not the drugs, that, that part's in there. But, and the reason that I wanted to go through this today, because if you truly believe Mr. Koberger is innocent, then you're gonna have to get your mind around what I just said about Mr. Koberger. Because I, can, I think I can prove his innocence beyond a reasonable doubt, but only under these circumstances. And it's gonna make more sense when I start my series tomorrow. So, but the first thing I'm gonna do before I close out these, this entire scenario that I've, that I've been delivering to you, I'm gonna do one video. I'm gonna go through some of the questions that I've received over the last few videos. And I'm gonna address some of those in the first video. If you have any more questions you'd like me to address, go ahead and post them in the comments here. I'm gonna do that first, and then I'm gonna start my new series. And I hope you stay with me on my new series because it's gonna be similar to the, what I've been talking about, but just in a painting in a little bit different light. So with that being said, thank you for tuning in. I almost sneezed there, sorry. Um, like and subscribe to the channel. And again, Pavarotti out.